Now the next presentation is about the uh, marine microbiomes and crops. And Henk, please. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm Henk. Uh, I am the work package leader for the work package tree on marine microbiomes. And uh, so what I'm going to tell you is a little bit different from the other experiments. And yes, it is not. Uh, because it's, I'm looking at the... Oh, I have to look there, of course. I'm looking at the... Um, the usage of marine microbiomes in traditional uh, agriculture or saline agriculture. So, so uh, the soil salinification is just an inevitable cause of uh, the rising sea uh, water levels, increased uh, temperatures. The soils are getting salter, and especially in the coastal regions, we will have a big problem that has to be solved. So what we can say is that we have a marine problem in the freshwater agriculture, so it requires a marine uh, solution, and, and I hope to show that it requires a marine microbiome solution. So the idea that we had is when we started in uh, Simba with the World Package 3 is to start growing, uh, uh, in our case, crops, potatoes, on uh, increasing salt levels. Now, there already were some studies done with potatoes and their salt uh, stress resilience. There are some, I mean, uh, overall, salt is a stressor for potatoes. You get much smaller potatoes. You lose about 50 or 80% of the uh, potato yield. There are some improved varieties that can increase again the potato yields, still less than the original. And what we aim to do is to see whether we can have a salt adapted microbiome and use that to fertilize or to amend to the potatoes under saline conditions. So, and that came all together in this uh, work package uh, task three on saline agriculture. And you have to understand that the use of marine microbiome in in general, I mean, uh, it, it, we were a little bit of an outlier in the uh, Simba because uh, using micro marine microbiome for food production is still in its infancy. So it was in its diapers, to say, when we started off, and I hope to show you that we now start uh, making our first steps. So the idea is, the question was, can a salt marsh microbiome, a natural a uh, vegetative zone that is naturally adapted to brackish water condition, water conditions. Can the micro, the natural microbiome from that be transplanted to uh, salt uh, or to uh, potatoes in the field under elevated salt conditions? So for that we had an excellent collaboration with an uh, experimental uh, farm, which, which, which had all those plots in which they could change the salinity and uh, which has all the, the, the normal effects of temperature changes and weather conditions and rain and you name it. Uh, unfortunately, half a year into the project, the salt farm went bankrupt. And of course, that, that was quite a, a big bummer and I have some worse words to pronounce, but okay, no, let's not do that. So this was a bit problem, especially for my project, my part of this Simba uh, project. So what to do? I am not a farmer. I am a diehard molecular microbiologist, fundamental microbiologist. So uh, I have a great team, uh, but they're also not farmers. Uh, thanks, team. <laughs> uh, so what we had to do was we had to start growing potatoes in-house. We had a climate room. We set it to a fixed temperature, we set it to a fixed humidity, etc. Or actually not yet to fixed humidity. We, I, set, I bought all these LED panels, I set up uh, all these plastic back, uh, bo boxes, I, I, I ordered um, ecological soil because yes, we have to be sustainable, so I, I want to do it best. Um, and I ordered a race of potatoes that is, was already used in other studies to be a little bit more solar resilient. It's called Desiree. So we started growing these potatoes, and to my pleasant surprise, they really started to grow on these conditions. Uh, and, and they even started to flower. It was actually the first time I saw potato flowers up close, and they're beautiful. In this experiment, what we did was we, we looked at the, the effect of salt concentration. We had five conditions in triplicate, three boxes, three potatoes per box, uh, at least tubers per box, so three plants per box. 
And we started from fresh water all up the way to increasing salt concentrations. Uh, in general, what we saw is on the, under the low salt concentrations, we find a nice plant, we find a nice uh, set of potatoes, and actually the yield of potatoes that we found in our boxes per square meter was comparable to the yield of the normal agricultural yield. So we were quite pleased with that. But under the higher salt levels, the potatoes didn't do that well. Uh, instead, all the uh, energy seemed to go into the plant because the plants became very thick, very sturdy. So, and this is the overview of the results. So in the picture below, you can see the normal potatoes on the... On the um, I guess that would be the... The right, oh, whatever, and on that side, uh, under freshwater conditions, and the more salt it gets, uh, the smaller the potatoes, the smaller the weight, and so on. Can also be seen in the figure, the blue line, the blue bars uh, indicate the, the weight of the potatoes, they're declining, whereas uh, the weight of the crop itself is increasing. Um, so we decided to go with the middle, which is 0.58% salinity, which was one part seawater and five parts fresh water. And that was to be the basis for our amendment experiments. Uh, we also did a tomato trial. I'm not going to talk a lot about this anymore because that unfortunately failed miserably. As you can see, we did not get the nice potato, uh, the tomato yields. We had problems with fungi. We had problems with humidity. And, and some of our lead panels broke during the time, so we had to improve the lead panels, we had to add a dehumidifier to the climate room. Uh, but finally we found again the optimal conditions to continue with uh, our experiments. But I had to focus on the potatoes. So going back to these uh, fields where I take my samples from, the original uh, salt marshes, and I also was looking at microbial match, which would be the, the center picture. Uh, where the salicornia starts to grow. The, this is a very high um, biomass and a high, rich, diverse ecosystem, uh, salt adapted, and it helps plants grow. And I've been sampling this beach for every two weeks for a whole year because I did not know that much about rhizobiomes. And I wanted to know whether the rhizobium is a fixed thing or whether it's really a seasonable changing thing. And, and I also Eric showed that, that there is some uh, changes over time because you have the, the initiation and uh, you have the, uh, the the plants start to grow, the propagation and so on. It's it is an ecological succession throughout the year. And we can also see that clearly in this figure, this is at the genus level uh, in the, the rhizosphere of these um, plants. And um, um, so what, what we see is that the uh, community continually uh, changes, differs. So, I selected the common rush as a plant to take my uh, microbiome for. The reason for that is because that's the only plant in the salt marsh that is present from January until December. All other plants, they were started to grow somewhere in, 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 in uh, March or so, so I, I, I could not follow them. I could not guess where they might start to grow a seed or whatever, so I went for this plant. We started to isolate organisms with about 100 uh, iso isolates, uh, and we used that for the amendment of the uh, potato uh, growth under this fixed condition, uh, fixed salt concentration. So we did not have 100 boxes, I only have 20 boxes, so I made mixes of these isolates, uh, randomly mixed, and, um, but we all, and I also add the, the, the natural salt marsh uh, microbiome, so the samples that I took, and I took a couple of different months to, to have a kind of a, this overview of the different, uh, or have a kind of, include the different microbiomes from the different uh, seasonal parts. This is the result uh, in terms of the potatoes. They're all quite small, they're all quite uh, low in weight, so it is quite reproducible. Um, and what we do see on the, um, on the, 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 on the left, uh, we see uh, that this is the plant weight. We can see that in some cases the plant weight is up to 53% higher than the control experiment. And the control experiment was same salt concentration, just no added microbiome. It had this natural microbiome from the soil 
and whatever was sticking to the potato tuber. And on the right side, we see the number of potatoes, uh, which was not so uh, variable or not so, uh, yeah, it differed that much. And we saw the potato weight, and if we normalize it again against the control, we see that we have up to 46% of an increased uh, yield in the potatoes uh, uh, when we used, in this case, the salt marsh microbiome, but also with one of the mixtures, mixture four. Uh, but still, it's way lower than the original, but then again, yeah, if you have a salt uh, soil, uh, every improvement is, 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 is the gain. So we did uh, the NMDS, similar to what uh, a kind of cluster analysis, analysis what Eric just showed. What we see is a distinct differences between the root community, so the microbes that really stick to the roots, and the community that's in the, the soil uh, associated, so rhizoplane versus rhizosphere. We also see a clear effect of the time. So we took a sample in the beginning, in the mid, and in the end of the soil. We see changes there. But if we look at the salt concentration, the effect of the salt concentration, it's not that dramatic. We don't see a major effect, um, no significance by uh, the analysis of variants. If I only look at the uh, microbes that stick to the root and then again do my analysis, I see just for one of the mixtures, mixture six, that there is a significant difference in the community based on the root. They contain several bacillus samples, uh, uh, species, and the Lysini bacillus species. Uh, at this moment, it's hard to say whether it, 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 these organisms were the cause of um, improved growth or whether they did something with the original microbiome to improve growth and so on. But that is, of course, uh, for future research. Um, the mixture four species that we also showed was, has the highest potato yield. Uh, I was trying to look whether I could find the same uh, pattern back as I saw for the, uh, as, as you see in the potato. So one of the species that are in this mixture, see if they are also maybe more dominant in the mixture four or more dominant than the others, but I don't see that. So the, uh, and, and, and it is known that abundance is at all. They, they could be locally abundant on the roots and they may play a major role. Again, what we do see is that these species in these mixes are still highly represented in the coastal microbial mat samples or in the salt marsh samples. So we do find, for example, a low abundant species that does follow a little bit the uh, scheme of the potato root, which is an uh, Methanosarcinae. But for that, I do not have, at this moment, a particular potential functional role that could explain this. Uh, but they have very low uh, abundant presence. So, uh, coming big to this part in overview is, it is important to have a look and to consider the fact that the uh, communities is, is not a fixed thing, the natural community. It's a changing thing. So we have to think about how are we going to amend our uh, our, our, our soil with these organisms? Do we have one fixed community that does all from, the, from January to December, or do we use different uh, subsets of communities, one that is better in the tuber development and the sprouting of the roots, or one that is developed better in the uh, flowering, etc., etc. These are all things that we, at least I am not where, uh, know yet and uh, would like to know. So. Despite this not so great experiments uh, or results yet, uh, we never give up. We have a huge load of uh, molecular data and I'm currently analyzing that. For example, we did from these 26 samples, we also have 26 metagenomes that are now currently uh, isolating with the partners of the University of Bielefeld. And we're trying to find, are there some typical genes that are known to maybe beneficial for plant growth promotion? And do we find, do we see back the seasonality? So can we again find clues to where and from which part of the season we should take our uh, communities? And in addition with the partners of uh, here in Denmark, we are also looking at the mobilome, the, plas the plasmids. Are there any genetic determinants that can tell us more about uh, the potential organisms that we find? Uh, and, and are they potentially uh, yeah, positive uh, for the, the, the use of these microorganisms 
or their direct interaction with the plants. Uh, yeah, that, that is more or less the story that I have. I have many thanks to all the people that uh, helped in this process. And I would like to specifically also thank uh, the uh, Horizon 2020 uh, project officer because he made it possible for us, or he or she, I don't know, it's a, uh, made it possible to uh, make the necessary changes in, the, in our uh, setup, in our work package description. Uh, to, to uh, deal with first the bankruptcy and of course to deal also with the uh, COVID situation. So, many thanks. Mm -hmm.